Oh, welcome back to Behind the Bastards, the only podcast that makes you sad. Uh, That's the promise we make with Behind the Bastards, is that after listening to this episode, your life will be worse. And to help me make your life worse, the great Joe Kasabian. Joe, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me back. I'm glad to finally get my uh, my Behind the Bastards hat trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, Wait, what's the hat trick? Oh, it's a that's three. a sports reference that you yeah. that you should really know. I was about to say because I don't I don't know you as a hat guy, Joe. Hat trick means uh, that you anymore, scored no. three times in in, in one oh, thing. Oh, okay, mm-hmm. yeah, okay. So okay. for everybody listening, they have to take their hat off and throw it uh, somewhere, anywhere. Okay, okay. Uh, well, 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 they're all busy doing that. I'm gonna throw you a story of a real piece of shit, Joe. What do you oh, know, boy. Joe Kasabian, host of the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast, author of several books. What's your latest, Joe? I forgot um, the title. So my latest. We'll do the plugs up uh, front now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I have uh, a military science fiction uh, series coming out. Uh, the first two books are currently out. You have um, the Undying. The whole series is called the Undying Legion. So if you look up the Undying Le- Legion series or my name, you could find it. Uh, and the first two books are currently out, and the third book will be out next month. Excellent, so. excellent, excellent. And you also have your work of nonfiction, The Hooligans of Kandahar. Um, people should check out all of your books. Now, you know who didn't write fiction, but did lie enough to be considered a fiction writer? Oh, boy. Lavrinti Beria. What do you know about Lavrinti Beria? Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, I oh, would he's... be brought in for Beria, wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he is. He is. If you've watched The Death of Stalin, he's the bad guy. I mean, everyone is the bad guy in The Death of Stalin, except for maybe Zukov, but he's the bad guy in The Death of Stalin. That's he's who the we're bad talking guy about. in everything. He was the bad guy in real <laughs> life, too. <laughs> One of them, you know? We open like a lot of our episodes with like comparisons to the usually the Nazis, right? We'll call King Leopold the Hitler of African colonialism or like the British Empire slow Nazis because <laughs> Nazis are like everyone's touchstone for the absolute depths of human evil. And one right. of the things that's interesting about Lavrinti Beria is that Stalin himself compared him to a Nazi during the Yalta. I think it was the Yalta conference when he's talking to like FDR. He calls <laughs> Beria our Himmler. Like that's how he introduces Beria to the president. Like this is my Himmler. Yeah, yeah I got we, one too. <laughs> we all got a Himmler. Well, Everybody's like got FDR a Himmler, or right? Churchill. It's like FDR yeah. or Churchill like said Stalin is a bastard, but he's our bastard. He's like, yeah, yeah he's Himmler, but he's our Himmler. <laughs> he's our Himmler. It's cool. We got one. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't agree with that comparison. He's not much like Himmler. Um, I guess he kind of, you know, Himmler runs the SS, Barrier runs the secret police because that's the comparison. But like Himmler is a hardcore believer, right? Himmler's right. not like a like a, a fair weather Nazi. He's like he's like into the occult. He's trying to he's got a castle where he's doing rituals and shit. Like one thing you could say about Himmler is he believed all that kooky nonsense. Really I, into witches. Really into witches. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Beria believed, I don't think Beria was really, like in his, I don't think Beria, Beria was a communist and that that was like the system he worked in, but I don't think he was like a, a hardcore believer, right? No. Beria was a, was a power guy, right? And he was going to do whatever would get him into power. He, I think he was the kind of guy, I, I'm, my knowledge of Beria is like, he would have been, he would have glommed on to any system that would allow him to do what he did. Right, right. He would have at least attempted, to, which I don't do to like, take any blame away from the, the horrible state communist system that existed in the USSR, particularly under Stalin. It's just, that's not the kind of dude Beria was. He was a a consummate opportunist. Um. The and that's kind of, of what's game, interesting man. about it. It's just the love of the game. He just loves being an asshole in a government. You know, he was he would have tried to find his way. His job is being a dickhead way. and he excels at his job. He was such a good piece of shit. Uh, I had a line in here about how he's got a body count only rivaled by these Australian dudes I met once in a Berlin hostel. But I wasn't sure if that was an obvious enough joke. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Don't don't room next to Australians in a hostel, guys. It's 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 just a mess. You know that don't, it's true, Australians. Don't, don't room next me. to Australians anywhere. Don't like- yeah, stay away. <laughs> That's why they're on that island. You know, 
they need to be there. It's the yeah. only thing that contains them is the isolation and countless venomous animals yeah. that will murder them if they step out of line. <laughs> when you get kicked out of the UK for being too much of a hooligan, you know, it says <laughs> something. <laughs> You know, there's one thing I can say positive about Australia is I love the national pastime of hooning. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to give them shit because Australians and Texans are the two peoples on the world that are like closest in their in their overall temperament. Uh, and neither of us likes to hear it, but it's it's undeniable when you spend time with both. Uh, Australia is Texas. If Texas wasn't connected to anything else. Yeah. If we if were allowed really... to exist in a vacuum. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Texas, a lot of people say the Texas of Eastern Europe is Georgia. I don't know if anyone's ever said that, Joe. Actually, um, as someone who lived in both Texas and Georgia, I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where our friend Beria is born. Um, and Georgia, the country, is in a tough historic position. If you just look at a map, you can and you and you have a vague knowledge of like the last thousand years, you can like put together in your head some of the problems Georgia was likely to have had, right? They're kind of in the middle. If you're if you're the Turks, right? If you're the Ottomans, George is in the way of where you want to get to, right? Man, that and sounds if you're, familiar. <laughs> if you're Europe, <laughs> George is also in the way of getting to places you want to go. If you're Russia, George is in the way. They're just kind of, they're one of those speed bump countries and they're going to wind up having kind of a tumultuous history as a result of just kind of being in the middle of a bunch of shit. <laughs> So by the end of the 1700s, Russia has won most of eastern Georgia in a gentleman's game of murder each other with the Ottomans. Uh, Russian interest in the area peaked whenever the Turks looked tired or weak and would fade whenever Turkey looked like it really wanted to throw hands. By the middle of the 1800s, this tug of war had gone Russia's way often enough that the, it, most of Georgia winds up in possession of the czars, who treated the Georgians about as carefully as they treated everything else, right? <laughs> not great. It's not great. A, a, about as great as Russia currently <laughs> treats Georgians within its borders. Yeah, that, that's, that's a generally accurate way to look at it. So Georgians, by and large, are not thrilled with this situation. Uh, but since the Turks hadn't really been any better, some of them started looking at some radical solutions to their having a government problem. And socialism is kind of the new hotness at this point. So in Georgia, socialism is kind of it becomes kissing cousins with nationalism. Right. Uh, and by the start of the 1900s, there were two broad socialist groups that were kind of gaining influence in Georgia. You got your Mensheviks and you got your Bolsheviks. Bolsheviks basically means the majority party and Mensheviks means the minority party. But the Mensheviks are much more numerous than the Bolsheviks. It's it's a little <laughs> bit of a fuck game there, right? The Mensheviks are kind of it's not really accurate to view them as social Democrats the way we know them, but they're closer to that than what becomes the government of the Soviet Union. Right. And that sounds pretty good to a lot of Georgians. And so the Mensheviks are larger. They're more organized than the Bolsheviks. And the Bolsheviks are going to spend all of subsequent history pretending it had always been the other way around. Right. This, again, that sounds very familiar. This, the, the exact same. Like uh, I am Armenian and uh, it, Georgians and Armenians are like they're they're brothers uh, culturally yeah. very 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 similar even in our own revolutionary history of like the first republic of armenia the the conflict between the mensheviks and the bolsheviks is mm -hmm. literally identical yes um, yes it, 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 it's through the caucuses in general the story yeah. is the story rhymes and, and this is you know beria is a little more georgia focused but he also he spends most of his early career in azerbaijan and he is kind of his whole life is his whole early political career is in the trans caucuses cuz you as you said you can't really separate Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia during this kind of revolutionary period in what had once been the Russian Empire. Like they're all very tied together. Um, and once they became their one country. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. So our subject for this week, Laverinti, is born right in the middle of this kind of surge in socialist organizing in Georgia on March 29th, 1899. So I believe he's an Aries Pisces cusp. Um, oh, if the that worst. matters to the worst. I, mean, I, I, I don't know anything about uh, signs. I just know whenever a sign is pronounced, the people that I mm -hmm. know that are into them always just like yeah. sigh Ugh. heavily. Like, of course, oh, God, <laughs> that's, of course, that's, that's exactly what he is. That's always my response. Whenever somebody brings up like, oh, yeah, and this famous person, this is this sign. You roll your eyes and go, oh, God, obviously <laughs> <laughs> they Such couldn't be more whatever move. you just said. <laughs> Becoming the head of the NKVD. What a Pisces move. <laughs> That's classic. It's right on the Pisces. <laughs> yeah. Doing the doing the Caden massacre, Catian massacre. That's a very classic Aries shit, right? Not surprised he's got yeah. both in him. Yeah. You wouldn't expect that from, say, a cancer. Oh, God, no, 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 no. 
I'm sure one of the Nazis was a cancer. They all kind of were. Anyway, Lavrenti Pavlovich Beria uh, is uh, becomes a baby March 29th, 1899. He's born in a small village, Merculi, uh, which is kind of out in the boonies near the Black Sea coast. His family are Mingrelian, which is an ethnic minority in Georgia with its own language, but not a written one. So they use the Georgian language for writing, but they've also got their own language that's kind of just an oral tradition. The fact that he's Mingrelian is going to become relevant much later near the end of his life because Mingrelian Mingrelians are different, right? They're not the same as everyone else in Georgia. And in the right. late Stalin Stalinist period, anyone who's part of an ethnic group that isn't Russian or mainstream Georgian is going to have a bad time, right? Un- unfortunately, <laughs> still kind of currently true as well. Still, this is, if you know one period in Russian history, there's some broad strokes you'll be accurate about in most of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> So Beria's Georgia was considered by Western Europeans to be among the most backwards parts of the continent. One visitor in 1891 from Germany claimed they didn't even know about crop rotation, which might speak more to his racism than actual agricultural practice, but it's undeniable that this was seen as the middle of nowhere in most people's eyes. And as a result, it's much more culturally isolated than most parts of the Western Russian Empire. It's not a very cosmopolitan place. Um, Beria's mother, Marta Ivanova, um, was 27 when she had him, which is pretty late in that yeah. period. Um, it's surprising. I was expecting you to say 14 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's late. I mean, she'd had some other kids, I think, before. Um, he, and she is described by Beria biographer Amy Knight as a, quote, simple, deeply religious woman who attended church regularly all her life. Some sources, including Knight's biography, claim she came from a noble background, although it was a branch of the nobility that had no money. Um, another biographer I read, a guy named Sangster, um, and a couple other people have come in to argue that he was probably had no noble blood. It was kind of a rumor. Might have been like a family legend. We've got this ancestry, but there's not evidence of it. But a lot of this comes down to like family lore as opposed it's, to something that it, like it's there's... very much a Caucasian thing to have like yes. deep family lore that is not at all grounded in reality. <laughs> it like yeah. started as like your great great uncle's once removed story, and then like spreads throughout your family until it's just spoken <laughs> yeah. as just unassailable fact. And it, it's tough because part of it, there, there's probably, there, almost certainly everyone has some noble ancestry because nobles fuck a lot of their servants and have a lot of illegitimate children. Like Stalin is going to be taken care of by this rich guy his mom worked for, right? Like he's this rich guy is going to give them a lot of money and Barry, his mom's going to have the same situation. And we don't know well, is it just because she worked for this guy? He considered her part of the family, so he helped out. Is it because they were stupid? Is it because there's like that he had an illegitimate kid with her, right? Like we will never know, you know. Maybe she's working the whole time, you know. Maybe she's yeah. working the whole time, right? Maybe she's got a little bit of Nancy Reagan magic. Um, <laughs> nothing against that, you know. Bar- so. Bury a family, the McGrelian yeah. throat goats. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting to note that a lot of Marxist rebel, le- like Marxist leaders, because all Marxists are kind of members of an illegal party in this period, whether you're kind Mm. of more in the Menshevik or the Bolshevik side, the czar doesn't like what you're doing. Most of the leaders of these Marxist organizations have a background where there's some nobility. A lot of them come from the cashless nobility, which is like a big thing all throughout Europe. You've got like your nobles who are rich and you've got your nobles who squandered everything. So they've got the blood, but nothing else. I know which Um, ones I respect more. Yes, yes. And a lot of leftist leaders in this period, particularly of youth organizations, are these like cashless nobles. And it makes sense because they they tend to benefit from much more of an education, but they're not really, even though they're nobles, they're not really the same class as the people with money because they don't have any fucking money. (laughs) So it's not hard to see, right, like why that would be uh, uh, the case. Um, Marta's got a pretty difficult life. Her first marriage gives her one son who dies young. Her husband dies too. So she she marries again. She has three more kids. One of them, Anna, is born deaf and mute. Uh, Another, who is Beria's brother, we know nothing about. So he probably died young too. And then she's got Beria, who's the only boy we know survived to adulthood. And by the way, her second marriage with Beria's dad ends the same way as the first, in that her husband dies. The the, The Beria family husbands have a a, a proud tradition of dying instantly after making kids. <laughs> we don't know if Lavrenti yeah. had something to do with any of this or it, not. <laughs> it's not, yeah, not a zero percent chance, right? Uh, he, he, if someone told me, like, you know, when he was barely able yeah. to walk, he sank a knife into someone's yeah. neck, I'd be like, yeah, probably. It's, 
<laughs> you hear a lot about like, yeah, you know, this this kid killed his mom in childbirth or whatever, right? Common story. Beria pops out with a knife and shanks his dad right in the <laughs> gut. <laughs> I mean, from my own family history, you know what? I'm okay with this. <laughs> <laughs> so Barry is going to be the only boy to make it to adulthood. And it's probably not surprising that Marta dotes on him, right? He is a mama's boy. And Stalin is as well. And another thing I've noticed when you read about a lot of the more influential like rebel leaders in Russia in this period, decent number of them are mama's boys, you know? Huh. So if you want your kid to overthrow the government, spoil them a little bit, moms, you know? It's good for them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Maybe I was also a run. mama's boy growing up, so I guess I'm just waiting for my time. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> don't let the... Uh, don't let the immigration board hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I already got my residency card, motherfuckers. <laughs> so one of his peers later recalled that he, quote, grew up on the hands of his mother who earned by her sewing. So that's kind of how she keeps the lights on, although the lights are not like electric lights. So she actually keeps the lights on by. It's how you buy the candles. Yeah. Buying candles. Yeah. <laughs> So here's how Knight describes Lavrinti as an adolescent in the book Beria, Stalin's first lieutenant. Beria was a mediocre student, not excelling in any subject, but considered cunning and devious. After completing school in Sukumi in 1915, Beria went to the city of Baku in Azerbaijan, where he enrolled in the Baku Polytechnical School for Mechanical Construction, remaining there for the next four years. Beria probably chose Baku for his studies instead of Tbilisi, which was much closer to home because it offered the specific course he was interested in. Nonetheless, Baku was almost 600 kilometers from home, quite a distance for a boy of only 16. Beria says in his autobiography that he supported himself, his mother, his sister, and young niece by doing office work during school vacations. Now, these claims that Beria is a shitty student but, you know, supports his family and somehow gets into Baku Polytechnic are primarily supported by a family friend and later comrade in the USSR government named Danilov. Um, and Danilov is the guy who's like, yeah, he wasn't book smart. He was a shitty student, but he's just cunning. We get a different version of what happened in a summary of Beria I found on globalsecurity.org, which is a think tank founded in 2000 that focuses on defense and foreign policy. Bob Woodward likes them. I don't know much more about them beyond that, but they seem to be relatively credible, and this scans with some other things I've read. In school, Beria did very well. As the best student, the villagers pride, he went to study in Sukumi. Apparently, they always moved in vain desire to advance, to be the first in any cost. And the, this is kind of a discrepancy you'll get. Like, Barry is either this shitty student who's super, you know, cunning and gets by on being a schemer, or he's a pretty good student who's, like, really well-respected in town because he's this local boy who does well. The fact that there are discrepancies in this and almost every other fact about the man comes down to the, the fact that most of what we know about Beria comes from either co-workers who later helped to murder him and thus wanted to make him look bad or his own cult of personality, right? Which is right. also full of shit. So it is yeah. it is really hard to know much for certain about particularly his early life. Um, Polish writer Thaddeus Whitlin, an early Beria biographer, even called Beria the man without history. Of course, Andrew Sangster notes... He then spends pages on his early life, how he dressed and even his thought processes, how he behaved in school. And from this, the reader can only assume it is mere conjecture. So, <laughs> again, like there's so much bullshit about this guy, even in the pretty good biographies. And I, I'm not shitting on Knight here. I think her book is generally quite good. But like there's just a lot of maybes with Beria. I think that's right? like, uh, you know, kind of part and parcel with a guy like yeah. Beria, right? Like, yes, yes. He When he comes to power, he's known for being terrifying, which you know obviously yeah. we'll get to. And one of the most terrifying things you can do and something that he had the power to do was erase his own history. Then you can't use it against right. him. Right. And that's a part of it. And also one thing Sangster will note is that most early Beria biographies are written after his execution when he becomes. So Stalin dies. They mm. kill Beria. And guys like Khrushchev comes into power next. And Khrushchev and everyone who kind of survives from the Stalinist era they're all complicit in the crimes of the Stalinist era, and they all want to blame everything that went bad in that period on Beria because it's it right. really works out well for them. So the books about him in this period are basically just novels with Beria as the villain. And he was a villain, but that doesn't mean everything in those novels is true, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> For his part, Sangster agrees that Beria was actually probably a really good student, and I, I kind of think he's right about this because from what I've read, Baku Polytechnic's a pretty competitive school, and it's not super common for kids like Beria from poor villages to go there if they're not really good students, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, far be it for me to say anything positive about the city of Baku, but uh, <laughs> yeah, like the, everything written about the Polytechnic is, is very, very good. Um, yeah. I've never heard it as like, you know, it's not a schlup school or anything mm -hmm. like, like that, and especially being from a village, being from a cashless noble family or just maybe a regular poor just family, whichever poor family. it may be. Um, you, you had to show some kind of promise in order to get in it. And they're not going to allow some dumbass who's coasting by on mediocre grades, but is quote unquote cunning. You can't right, judge right. cunning <laughs> on standardized testing. Yeah. Maybe if he was getting like an English degree where bullshitting was part, but he's like in architecture, right? You presume right. he had to show some promise. It's always um, the fucking architects, Robert. You can't never, trust them. Look, I've been saying this for years, Joe. We have to kill all the architects, you know. And I know that's half of our listeners. We're huge among architects, but you're all you're all the death of this world. And uh, you can't trust them. I don't know what mm -hmm. it is. That's a mm -hmm. lot like horses. I don't know what no. it is. Yeah, Just don't trust them. No horses, no architects. That's the new that's the new anarchist flag. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get people to adopt. That's right. Um, but if you hate architects, you know who's working to destroy them all and and end all laws about how you can and can't build a house are sponsors. So buy from them and help them lobby Congress to make it legal to do your own electrical work. You know, it's safe. <laughs> We're back, and I just, in the break, rewired uh, my entire home. Um, I've, I've found out that if you don't put that plastic coat around the wires, it really cuts down on the weight, you know, of your house, which is, is helpful. Yeah, um, and now I, I have nothing but mail-to-mail -mail plugs, mm -hmm. uh, like the mm -hmm. suicide plugs, holding ah, all yes, of my equipment plug. together. <laughs> 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 I'm really happy they, they ponied up the money to mm -hmm. get, like, mm -hmm. you know, awareness yeah. out there for yeah. uh, Rube Goldberg S mm -hmm. ways to kill yourself yeah. with electricity. I'm all on board for it. <laughs> yeah, let's 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 uh, actually, Sophie, can we get a sponsorship from the people who make those mail to mail plugs on Amazon that burn down your house and kill your family? <laughs> I think that's I'll the read an line. ad for them. Probably not. <laughs> I would just well, assume no. Buy them anyway, folks. They're probably safe. It's the Speaking only of product probably. you only have to, have to buy once. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Beria would have liked them. Um, he liked <laughs> killing people. So there's a weird mention by one of the first Soviets to chronicle Beria's life uh, that he and his family were supported by cash gifts from a wealthy noble that his mom worked as a servant for. Kind of, again, makes me wonder if she was maybe getting some strange. There are rumors that actually Beria might be this guy's son. Mm. Um it's plausible, yeah. but the, you get this like literally the same thing happened with Stalin. So I think the fact is just this is not a really uncommon social relationship. Like if your mom was hot in rural Georgia, she probably had like a wealthy patron. Right. Uh, yeah. And why why not? It's hard to get by back then. You know, your husband's going to die three times in your life. You need money from somewhere. I mean, what, what are your options? You will be like right. you're a penniless dirt farmer or you let some like rich guy clap them cheeks for like 15 seconds every two yeah. weeks. <laughs> Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? <laughs> it's, Sign it's, me up. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm on board. Uh, I'm on. Well, no, actually, you and I are both dying at age 19 after fathering our fifth child <laughs> in the a classic man can tradition. Dream. <laughs> so when Beria was five or six, Russia gets convulsed by revolution for the first time in his life. We know now that this was the prelude to the 1917 revolution, but at the time, a lot of people would have seen the complete and devastating crackdown by the czar as evidence that the regime was pretty strong, right? You get this, this, this does not go well, and the czar kills so many fucking people. Now, in those days, again, the left-wing opponents of the czarist system are Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. The Bolsheviks are a tightly centralized party led by Lenin, who is not in country for a lot of this period, um, and they want He's a one-party. He's in Germany, right? He's in Germany for a spell. He, he moves around a bit. I'm not an expert on his his whole movements, but he's he's out of the he's out of the country, leading from afar for most of Beria's early life. Um, and the Bolsheviks are very centralized. Uh, they're a one party state that wants one party control of a proletarian dictatorship. Right. That's the whole idea. Mm. The Mensheviks are again closer to social democrats, and as a result, are more popular for most of Beria's childhood because most people generally prefer not one party rule to one party rule. 
that does change rapidly at points. But whenever anybody throws around a term like dictatorship, it's yeah. uh, it's a turnoff. I'm not on board. I'm not generally yeah. on board. Now, in this case, you can debate like that. Your if your choice is dictatorship of the proletariat to the czar. I don't I don't think you're wrong in saying like, well, let's try anything but having a fucking czar. I get right. it. <laughs> you know, like if I was ruled by Tsar Nicholas, I would accept anything that is not Tsar Nicholas. Anything that's not the czar. It makes yeah. sense to me. <laughs> Logical step. Um, from the age of 16 on, Barry is going to be his mother's primary means of financial support, which means that he's able to, when he moves to Baku, kind of one of the things he does, he gets involved in socialist organizing. And one of his jobs for the student organization he's in, because he's working full time. He has a lot of connections with workers that are also organized in different Marxist like unions and stuff. And he's able to make connections between the student group that he's at at the college and these like laborers who are not super educated. Right. So that's kind of his his earliest job as a not not even quite a revolutionary, but certainly an activist at this stage. More, more just like a, your run of the mill organizer. at the time. Yeah. Now, th- to, to note, though, there is a revolutionary aspect to even being run of the mill as an organizer, because this is still treason, right? Like, right. He, this yeah. is illegal, you know, light treason, you might call it, but treason nonetheless. You're still going to get a visit by some dudes who are going to drag you into a dark basement. Right, right. The Okrana is not going to be thrilled with what you're getting up to. <laughs> and by the time the big dub dub uno is underway, that's World War One. Everyone hates it when I when I use those terms for them. I got to say I'm not a fan. <laughs> not, no, nobody likes it. I don't like it, but I'm doing it. Um, much like having a czar. It's, it's just one of those things that can't change until there's a bloody revolution. So, you know, I guess I'm going to have to revisit people. Oregon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, so by the time World War I starts, he's 16 or so, um, and he and several fellow students set up an illegal study circle poring over the works of Marxist theory. Beria is treasurer of the group, and in March of 1917, he joins the Bolshevik Party. Um, now, this only happens, he only becomes a Bolshevik after the revolution gets that czar out of their hair, right? They 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 wash him out. And prior to that point, Beria is into, again, radical politics, but we don't have any evidence of him participating in like armed revolutionary activity. Um, so right after he joins the Bolshevik party, he gets conscripted into the army and he's sent to the Romanian front to serve as essentially a combat engineer, right? I think he's actually doing like hydraulic shit, probably to make sure that troops have water is as best as I can term it. Yeah, um, make sure this water only has the minimum amount of cholera yeah. necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want too little cholera, right? Yeah. Like, you know, a growing soldier needs some cholera. Yeah, it, um, it makes it strong. Like, keep, World War One is one of those things. Healthy. It's like there's so many episodes in that arc that yeah. would make the world a much better place if a bullet sailed just like five centimeters to the mm. left or the right. Oh, my God. There's that sad, sad story about that British sniper who has Hitler in his sights. And we know this is true because, like, he remembered it. And Hitler's like, yeah, I saw this guy get a bead on me. And she, and the, the, the Brit the Brit was like, well, the fighting was basically over. They were in retreat. And I was like, I don't want one more boy to die today. And you can't blame a man for for doing that. But oh, if time, only, yeah. <laughs> if Man, only that motherfucker Hitler. must have kicked his own ass harder than <laughs> <What>? anyone else. <laughs> it's one of those moments from history where it's like, what is the lesson here? Kill more teenagers? Like, like what the, do, the lesson what do we that I'm take taking from this? this is never take mercy on your enemies because <laughs> yeah. one of them might be Hitler. <laughs> It's like that woman who like stops Hitler from committing suicide by trying to like talk him out of it. And it's like, yeah, what do you, what do you get from this? <laughs> like, where do you where do we uh, where do we she draw wrestles conclusion? alongside Hitler, puts her yeah. arm around her is like, have you heard of better help? <laughs> <laughs> Don't learn lessons from history, people. That's the primary <laughs> lesson of this podcast. Ignore everything I say and get on with your life. Um, Especially if you got a motherfucker in your crosshairs and he has a weird yeah. little mustache, yeah. you have no choice. Look, shoot anyone with a mustache. That's, that's what right. that's really the lesson. <laughs> so by this point, when Beria gets sent to the Romanian front, Russia is, st- you know, the, the czar is no longer in power and the government that replaces it is essentially democratic. Right. This, the Bolsheviks are not in charge yet. This is not the USSR. It's kind of a socialist democratic state. It's not a very functional socialist democratic state. Right. Which is well, why is some other Caucasus. things are going to happen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is the Caucasus. So things are even like a little messier. But this ailing new democracy is still fighting the czar's war. Right. Which is a bad call. There's they probably should have done something besides continuing to fight World War One. 
it seemed like a like a like an easy uh self uh like an easy own goal it's like you know this really unpopular war that drove people to revolution i have an i have an idea what let's if keep we keep sending, doing it yeah let's keep throwing down with the germans I what if we we'll just beat them? fed another generation of our men into yeah. a meat grinder to to make some kind of multi-ethnic mush yeah yeah great great call so it doesn't go well right and there's going to be a Bolshevik revolution. I think we're all familiar with kind of the broad terms of this. And this is when Beria kind of gets involved, right? During this this very chaotic period, he becomes the Bolshevik revolu- uh, party representative for his military unit because all of the units have like effectively these unions and his is a Bolshevik one. Um, and when the war finally ends, he moves back to Baku where the Bolsheviks are now ascendant. In the rest of Azerbaijan, I think it's still more Menshevik, but like Baku, the Bolsheviks are really starting to pick up a lot of steam. And he gets a position on the staff of the head of the Baku Soviet of Workers Deputies, right? So he's, he's, it's kind of just because he's known as, and this again makes me think those things about him not being a good student are not accurate. He keeps getting positions that are kind of high despite not having much experience because the stuff he's doing is always like he's the treasurer, he's organizing, he's doing like bureaucratic shit because most people don't want to do that. And it, it, right. he's got that kind. He's got that. He's got an organizer brain, right? He's good at organizing, like, like departments and shit. Um, and he's willing to do that kind of boring but necessary work to lay the grounds to like actually have a a, a large organization that does shit. Um, and that's why he keeps getting put in positions because like most people want to do the sexy stuff, and Barry is like, I'll do the hard bullshit paperwork stuff. Um, is not bullshit. Like, but, I mean, that's you know, that's the key to power is doing the stuff yeah. that nobody else wants to do and doing it well. Yeah. Again, I say this a lot. This is also the story of like Ceausescu. If you overthrow the government and are running a revolutionary party, and there's a quiet little dude who doesn't say much, but he's always taking on bullshit work and you know really helpful, shoot that guy immediately. <laughs> immediately, <laughs> you know. He, he volunteers to run the people's DMV. Take that motherfucker mm-hmm. out no, back out, immediately. Out. Yeah, exactly. That man needs to end up in a fucking quiet little grave. <laughs> <laughs> so this was not an auspicious time to be helping to run the Baku Soviet because with Russia, you know, breaking out in revolution. A lot of people are like trying to take advantage of this. And one of the people's trying to take advantage of this as a result of the war is Turkey, right? And Turkey's like, maybe we can have a little Azerbaijan as a treat. So they invade and they wind up in charge of Baku for a little while in 1918. They are not in power there long um, because, spoiler, after 1918, the Ottoman Empire doesn't do great. No, it <laughs> doesn't do very well, man. But um, they sure did a lot of damage before they finally died. <laughs> they sure did. They went out like <laughs> they went out like heroes. If heroes are constantly fucking up everything around them, they went out like a dying empire, I guess is probably better to say. So pretty soon, you know, the Turks are back out um, and the Bolsheviks kind of wind up in you know, quasi power. You know, they, they have a lot of power in the city after the Turks leave. They're not in absolute power and they're kind of fighting Um, with another party for actual control of the city. Now, Beria, being young enough that he's not yet well-known in politics, is picked to be a mole for this party, the Musabat party, that are kind of have have turned themselves into the primary opposition of the Bolsheviks. Um, And they are to this day the oldest party in Azerbaijan still. Uh, They're going to they spend long periods of time kicked out of the area, exiled. A lot of their people get killed, but they still do exist. Um, And Beria being, you know, a pretty young guy and being this dude who he's had some prominent roles. So he's got some trust in the Bolsheviks, but he's also not a face man, right? Like he's somebody that like is not super well known personally is picked as a perfect mole to infiltrate the Musavat party. And I'm going to quote from that write-up in Global Security. He worked as a clerk at the Caspian Company, White City, performed various assignments trapped underground. In the fall of 1919, Beria joined the counterintelligence of the Committee of National Defense of the Azerbaijan Republic. Subsequently, this period of Beria's life caused a lot of rumors. It was said that he consciously worked on the Azerbaijani nationalists and even was an agent of the British. And you'll basically get claims that he was working every side of like the political conflicts in Azerbaijan in this period. He's a some people will say he was actually a, a Musavat agent, like spying on the Bolsheviks. He was a Bolshevik spying on the Musavats. He was like spying for the British on everybody. Um, There's no real evidence for most of that. I think the likeliest thing here is that he is spying for the Bolsheviks on the Musavat party. 
I um, do love the idea that a Georgian guy messy. is like a hardline as a uh, Azerbaijani nationalist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but he's like uh, he's going hard for that. Um, <laughs> which, like, spoiler, he's not at all an Azerbaijani <laughs> nationalist. Um, he is going to kill a lot of Azerbaijani nationalists along with a lot of Armenian and Georgian nationalists. That's going to be his first real big gig for the U.S. This is what happens when you give someone from the Caucasus power over the Caucasus. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> nobody hates us more than we hate ourselves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Again, Again, much like Texans. Exactly. Um, so if you read more casual articles about Beria, they will all note that he's a member of this anti-Bolshevik Musavat party. And calling them anti-Bolshevik is like not entirely. It's close enough if you're getting like a, a broad summary of what's going on there. But I think Amy Knight's biography does a better job of contextualizing who these folks were and what Beria did with them. Quote, the Musabat Party had originally been formed in 1911 to 1912 by a group of intellectuals associated with the RSDRP. It later shifted ideologically to the right and became the party of the rising Azerbaijani bourgeoisie. After a period of cooperation with the Bolsheviks in Baku, during which they supported the Soviet, the Musabatists increasingly opposed Bolshevik policies. By late 1917 and early 1918, they had become the Bolsheviks' most formidable rivals. In the autumn of 1919, Beria was assigned by the Bolsheviks to conduct counterintelligence within the ruling of its government. So you have this party that is, it starts as an intellectual party that's pretty left wing, but like social Democrat, right? And they're willing to work with the uh, the Bolsheviks in Baku for a period of time when kind of the in the most chaotic post-revolutionary period. But as the Bolsheviks start to gain power and it becomes clear that they are not willing to compromise or share power with anyone else, the Musavidists, in part because they represent a lot of people in the bourgeoisie, but also because they just aren't a one-party state, increasingly reform themselves as an opposition party to the Bolsheviks, right? And that's kind of what happens here. And again, you can find sources who say Barry is working with them legitimately, and that wouldn't be so weird because he's an opportunist and they are in power for a period of time. So it's not impossible right. that he is he's doing both. That like he's really trying to hedge his bets here. He's feeding some information to the Bolsheviks in case the Bolsheviks win, but he's also trying to help the Musavidists because maybe they're going to win. And Beria is this kind of like wherever the wind blows is is kind of where I'm going to try to make you know a place for myself, right? If he and was I alive kinda, now, he would just work for like the Young Turks Network or something. Yeah, it, yeah, like yeah. once <laughs> once that audience got, uh, failed, he'd just go work for Ben Shapiro. You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he is one of these guys who like would absolutely have made a hard right turn if that had been the way to gain power. Right. But the the whites are never really like I don't think there's ever a period where they're like winning well enough where he is that he he would have considered that. Right. Right. But it does kind of look like there's a period where he's willing to maybe make his peace with the Musavits, you know, um, if that's going to be who winds up in power. But, you know, we don't really know. Um, and certainly the Bolsheviks believe that he is legitimately spying on the Musavidists for them, right? And this is going to become a problem for Beria right away because while he's going to get a bunch of other gigs spying, you know, back in Georgia, the Bolsheviks are going to keep using him as a spy. In like 1920, not long after this period, after the Bolsheviks win, he's going to be tried by the Central Committee in Azerbaijan for being a Musavidist spy. And the, <laughs> the case is resolved in his favor. But every time he gets in trouble within the party, the allegations come back up because it's the easiest way to like fuck with him, right? Is to point out that like, well, you did this at one point. We don't really know whose side you were on. Um, a, that's, a, that's a good example of like how he becomes the guy he, he is because he got picked as a spy being disloyal or whatever it goes yeah. to, goes to trial gets away with it he's like in the future he's like well that's never gonna happen again Ugh. yeah <laughs> now one thing that definitely suggests he was a legitimate spy for the bolsheviks is again they keep using him as one and after the bolsheviks kind of gain the upper hand in baku he gets sent back home to georgia to do some spying right and in georgia in tbilisi the mensheviks are in charge right they are the dominant party when he gets sent there and the Bolsheviks are not cool with this. So they have guys like Beria go among the peasants to try to prod them into maybe overthrowing the government again and seeing if that works out better for everybody. So Beria moves to Tbilisi where he constructs his very first spying network. And Joe, do you remember when you constructed your first spying network to overthrow uh, the government in power? Oh, I was but a young boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You make a lot of mistakes, right? We all make a lot of mistakes uh, when we're overthrowing a political party. You know, it happens. And and that's going to this is a messy period for Beria. I'm going to quote from Knight's biography here. 
Not surprisingly, he was soon arrested, along with the entire Bolshevik Central Committee in Georgia. Thanks to the efforts of the Georgian Bolshevik Georgi Sturia, Beria was freed on the condition that he leave Georgia within three days. But he remained, adopting the false name Lakerbea and working in the Russian embassy. So he like makes this promise to leave, and then instead of leaving, he flees to the embassy, and he gets right back to working as a spy to try to to because this is the Russian embassy, and the Russian government is controlled by the Bolsheviks at this point. I know there's this is a very messy period of time, right? right this would but, have been what the first Georgian Republic period. So right, yes, yeah. yeah. And so he is hiding out in the Russian embassy because that is a Bolshevik embassy and still continuing to work to try to overthrow the Mensheviks in Georgia. Um, And kind of right around this time, the Russian government concludes a treaty with Georgia. But like most treaties between Russia and a neighbor, it's more of a wink by the Russians than a promise. (laughs) The Mensheviks take their side of the treaty seriously, though, and they free all of the imprisoned Bolsheviks that had just tried to overthrow the government. And they even make it legal for the Bolsheviks to have meetings and publish newspapers again. The Mensheviks are really, this is again another lesson, don't give anyone the benefit of the doubt in a revolution. You know? Yeah. When like, someone tries to overthrow the government, maybe you like keep them in prison. Right? Yes. Maybe. Uh, ma- maybe this is relevant in the United States. I don't know. Perhaps. I've never read anything <laughs> about our recent history. Um, so when the latest Bolshevik plot to take power is revealed, because they try again, Beria gets arrested again. And he goes on a hunger strike, but it's like one of those, he skips dinner hunger strikes, you know, (laughs) it doesn't last very long. And he gets sent out of Georgia on a prison convoy. By August, he's back in Azerbaijan and he gets back to being a student. He kind of goes back to school for a while and he catches a side gig for the Bolsheviks, who at this point are doing very well in Baku. But Lenin has demanded at this point that that Azerbaijan be brought over into what's becoming the USSR wholesale. And the Bolsheviks in Baku start a serious effort to do just that. It's possible that this is when Beria meets Stalin for the first time, because Stalin, as part of this effort that that Lenin's pushing, gives a speech in Baku in November of 1920. Now, at this time, Beria's specific job is executive secretary of the Extraordinary Commission for the Expropriation of the Bourgeoisie and the Improvement of Working Life. Man, um, they love titles. They fucking love titles. That's too long for a job title, right? And and what that job actually is, is he's taking shit from like rich people and middle class people and theoretically splitting it up among the working class. Now, how much of that gets split up and how much of that gets lost to rampant corruption? Well, it's a Zerbishan, you know? <laughs> Thanks <laughs> so that has changed. <laughs> Let's be fair. It's the Caucasus, right? <laughs> like, it's yeah, Eastern thank, Europe. Like, again, yeah. thankfully, this no longer happens. Mm-hmm. It's a place populated by humans. So a lot of it <laughs> disappears into corruption. Knight writes of his this period in his life, this organization was charged with forcibly seizing property on behalf of the Bolsheviks, a rather unsavory business, and Beria again was doing the paperwork. When the commission was abolished in February 1921, Beria took the opportunity to persuade the Central Committee to support him in his studies as an architect builder. He received a stipend from the Baku Soviet, but only after a couple of weeks, the Central Committee made him abandon his studies to work in the Azerbaijan political police, the infamous Cheka. And this is when he becomes a secret policeman. And that's what we're going to get to after this next ad break. So be the secret police in your life and arrest these products into your home. Cop. Don't tell people to be cops. But but cops of products, (laughs) Sophie. Don't tell people to be cops. Is it a cop cop or is it a spy or is it both? Yeah, both. Spy on these products, whatever it takes to get them into your home, you know? That's what we believe. Don't listen to him. We're back. So the Cheka are the secret police in in Georgia and Azerbaijan and everywhere, right? And they're going to go through several. This is what ends up the different Chekas all eventually end up as the NKVD, right? Which all eventually ends up as the KGB. You know, this is like a process, right? If there's one thing the Soviet Union likes more than titles, it's changing those titles oh arbitrarily. My God. So many. I'm going to call them the Cheka for most of the period before, like, Beria is in Moscow and the USSR is fully settled. But they go through some different names, right? But it's generally, like, everyone still generally calls them the Cheka at various points because they're still the secret police, right? Whatever titles they're picking. Right. This is the position where Beria is going to truly shine, because the first big task the Bolsheviks need from him is to overthrow the Armenian government. Now, Joe, have you ever tried to overthrow the Armenian government? 
I cannot legally answer that question. <laughs> well, it's a whole thing, right? It's this, how, wait, you gotta do, there's some steps. How the fuck did I make it this long in life without knowing Barry was involved in the overthrow of the First Armenian oh, Republic? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And of course he came from Azerbaijan to do it. Oh, God damn uh, it. Yeah. Well, at this point he's coming in from Georgia, but through but through Baku, right? Ah, They're in the mix. All, They're in the mix. The bridge yeah. is there. It's fine. The, yeah, it's clear. So- there's a lot that you have to do to overthrow the first Armenian Republic. And Beria, along with several of his colleagues, put together different plans for how they might make this happen, right? And it's one of those things where, like, there's a lot of, like, different pitches. And Beria's is kind of the one that winds up being the um, the kind of basis for the plan they eventually execute. And I've been in right? a lot it's of writer's it's... room, and I feel like a writer's room with Lavrenti Berry would be the worst one ever. <laughs> it is. It's a terrible writer's room. He's always suggesting fucking bottle episodes. <laughs> so Berry's boss is a guy named Mirkafar Bagarov. He's just a 24-year-old who's in head of the Baku Cheka. Um, he's got a reputation for brutality, and he likes Beria because Beria is willing to do fucking anything. He is perfectly willing to get his hands dirty. Oh, um, so God. at 21, Beria gets promoted to be Bagarov's assistant. Um, and this is, you know, the start of a fairly rapid series of promotions. Because people are killing and dying so rapidly, it's easy to move up if you're really willing to kill, you know? And it's interesting, Bagarov is kind of the only guy other than Stalin, maybe, that Beria ever works under without later overthrowing or killing. Right. This is like one of the very few people who is Beria's boss that he does not murder or otherwise help to destroy. I, w- um, I wonder what the difference was, because it wouldn't be like dirt. Like Beria was more than comfortable killing people who had dirt on him. Yeah, I think they may just kind of get along. Maybe they were actually long. friends. It was like Beria's yeah. one friend. <laughs> yeah, they might have just kind of been buds. And also, I think it's that like he knows Bagarov is never really rising above a certain level. So it, he doesn't need to, right? He kind of can leapfrog over him without fucking him. And it's useful to have a guy like Bagarov who like owes you a favor that you can, you know, trust. That's um, more, as that's, much as that Beria sounds more likely everybody. than Beria having an actual friend. Yeah, well, like his one buddy. <laughs> now, Andrew Sangster argues that Beria begins in the Cheka, quote, a lifelong habit of intrigue against his own superiors in the hope that he could destabilize them to his own advantage. His next boss, Ivan Pavlinovsky, pleaded at staff meetings for his deputy Beria to cease intrigues against him. So like during meetings, <laughs> please stop plotting to overthrow me. Like, I mean, we're trying to do a please job. Stop it. <laughs> oh, God. It's That's so a funny. great complaint to have in your employee record. Mm-hmm. Like, I know personally, yeah. I have never been uh, publicly mm-hmm. told at like, you know, like the firefighters board or mm-hmm. whatever by my captain to please mm-hmm. stop plotting against it. <laughs> please stop plotting my murder. You can't you have to you can't do this anymore. It is really funny. It, you know, again, the death of Stalin, not wildly accurate to the to the direct history. I do think it gets like the broad strokes of the relationships pretty well. Yeah. Um, but the Ar- Armando Iannucci, the, the writer, is also the guy who did uh, Veep. And he did a, a show that Veep is kind of based on that was uh, based on UK politics. I always forget the name. And he's like, I want to see him do like a three season series about the early Soviet politics in the Caucasus, Um, because you could make a wildly entertaining comedy about this. Like a lot of people die, but everyone is such a piece of shit. There's all so much backstabbing and overthrowing each other. You have a lot of fun like a young Stalin treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Like Koba era shit. If if you ever watched the, there's a really good TV show, um, The Great, which is about. Oh, it's um, wonderful. Yeah, it's wonderful. What's her name? The Great, uh, fucking Catherine. Um, yes. Yeah, the who's who's a czar, Zarita, Zaritza. I always forget the proper term when it's the woman, but she's fully in charge. And, and Zarina. Nothing. Anyway, Zarina. But one of the things that show gets really well, and again, wildly inaccurate to the literal. S- s- like steps of history, but it gets really well the kind of constant backstabbing and like overthrowing and shit in uh, that. That's a, a long time uh, hallmark of Russian politics. Um, yeah. And, yeah. To, and to its credit, it never even attempts to be no, accurate and no. even says like, this is not accurate in like the, the ticker before the show starts every mm-hmm. episode. It's still fucking no. wonderful. It's fun. It's got got some got some great performances by uh, uh, Nicholas Holt, one of my favorite actors. Good shit. Check it out. Three real solid seasons. 
So Beria is going to prove no less brutal to his colleagues than he is to the citizens of uh, Azerbaijan and Georgia and Armenia. Um, Sangster writes, quote, the Cheka's main task was to crush any counter-revolutionary group which was interpreted with the widest possible guidelines. It was a time of festering chaos, distrust, and sheer brutality. In 1921, the Troika system was announced, which was a three-man committee empowered to judge and execute on the spot. And Beria played a major role in such proceedings in his area of responsibility. In his very early 20s, he had become accustomed to having people killed, not in the front line of war, but dragged off the streets or out of their homes and shot in police cells. That's so now, much more personal, though. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, like, there's a difference between a guy who's, you know, seen a lot of conflict and, and kills people in the trenches of World War One, because that's largely impersonal. And, you know, a soldier's mindset is much different than a guy who's murdering someone in a dang yeah. basement. Yeah, you always you have at least on your conscience, like because obviously war fucks people up. But like, yeah, I, I shot some people because they were shooting at me is different from I pulled this guy away from his family during dinner. This dude I'd worked with for years and I right. shot him in the back of the head. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like they can't fight back. They're in a dank no. basement. Probably. Yeah. A lot of torture has happened before this. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the this causes a tremendous amount of paranoia, right? Even among the winners in these conflicts, right? They they it kind of breaks everybody's mind, right? And the atmosphere grows paranoid enough that occasionally the right people are arrested, right? Sometimes that even happens. Um, well, when you after enough people, you'll eventually yeah. grab someone who's guilty. <laughs> yeah. And one of those people is Beria. Shortly after his appointment to the Cheka, he gets taken into custody by the Cheka under suspicion of anti-revolutionary activity. Now, this was right because he is executing a lot of revolutionaries. But <laughs> all of the people he's killing pretty much are socialists, right? But this is not accurate in a way they can care about and he is set free and continues to work killing revolutionaries. Now, I've noted a few times I'm not wildly in love with any single source for these episodes, largely because trying to do a biography of a guy like Beria is just this horrifying task given how much disinfo is pumped out in his uh, lifetime. Knight's book seems pretty good. I've definitely found a couple of conclusions in her book that I've considered shaky. I like Sangster's writing, and I think he's reasonably careful, but he also might be kind of a weird right-winger. Like, just looking at his bibliography, I don't see anything overly insane, but his book contains, like, a casual Jordan Peterson quote. Oh, um, God. Yeah. So that was one of those things where like, well, fuck. And I had like looked into the guy and like, I don't see anything in, <laughs> right. inherently he crazy. Did books on Rhodesia yeah. at any point? Yeah. <laughs> no, his biggest thing is he's like obsessed with this guy. Yeah, he's a, he's a professor and he, he writes this book about Alan Brook, Churchill's right hand critic, like this this reappraisal of Lord Alan Brook, who's this. World War II British military officer. Like, I I don't know much about Alan Brook, but I, I don't see anything that's like inherently crazy about any of this. So I don't know. I, I just want to let you know. a Jordan Peterson quote into- That worried me. Wait, was right? that in his book about Beria? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he like, it's that this That is quote, the most out of left so field weird. it could possibly it's, be. It, it immediately made me like backtrack and check on a bunch of shit that I had. And again, I didn't run into anything that was like obviously wrong. Most <laughs> of what he said lines up with most of what Knight said. And like, again, now that I point where like Knight's like- I just want to hear the whole like, biography done in Jordan Peterson voice. Right, yeah. <laughs> the thing about the Venti Barrier. I didn't love it, yeah. And I, I've got like a couple of different- quotes from this or books that I use for this Knight's book, Sangster's book. Um, there's another book called All on Stalin's team that I use a lot later. That's about like the whole gang around Stalin. Um, there's a little bit of the Stalin uh, hype house. Yeah. The Stalin hype house. So like I tried to be broad with this. And again, I didn't catch Sangster just lying about anything, but you should know you're not going to find any like perfect sources on a guy around whom there's so much disinfo. Right. And and broadly speaking, the two big the, I think the two big things that you can argue about in terms of like what kind of guy Beria was that you can support with a lot of evidence. One is he was an absolute psychopath and one of like the most unhinged, violent, evil people within the Soviet government. And the other is he was as violent and evil as he had to be to survive within the system. And he was a guy who wanted to maintain power and was willing to do terrible things to keep himself alive but was not wildly worse than most of his colleagues, which doesn't mean he's good, right? Those are kind of broadly speaking, the two barriers that you can I make a case for. I could see 
both with yes, the, like the, I can see the, both the caveat of being like, yeah, he was surrounded by just yeah. odious, both are really bad human beings. <laughs> yeah. But there's not many people that rose to the, the lengths that he did the Soviet Union. Yes. That, asterisk that we're aware of. Yeah. That did the things that he did on his own personal time. Yes, and that we will be talking about that later as well. It takes a bit to build to that because a lot of that starts to happen, or at least we have documentation of the sex abuse stuff once he hits Moscow, which we right. are not at yet, right? Um, so anyway, I, I just wanted to like, <laughs> FYI, <laughs> you should know this about our sources, you know? Barry has layers like an ogre. Yeah, yes, and so do his biographers. And speaking of Sangster, you get lines like this during a discussion of how Beria and his fellow Czechists abuse their powers that I found interesting. Even modern day police officers in an open liberal democracy sometimes query the activities of their next door neighbors. And it is understandable that in a ruthless society, the sense of suspicion and doubt increases exponentially. And I, what? He's not wrong in that, like, yeah, m- modern police officers abuse their powers to spy on, like, women they're stalking and their neighbors yeah. and shit all the time. Not I mean, a, to be not fair, the NYPD thing. would hire Lavrenti Barry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's that part of makes me think like, well, maybe the Jordan Peterson thing was like not evidence of anything sinister because he is kind of being like modern cops are terrible in a lot of the same ways Barry was, and I don't disagree. Actually, <laughs> this is one of those horrible moments. Like yeah. even the worst guy in the world is right. Yeah. You know, not. Not an not an inherently an unreasonable <laughs> caveat. But there's so many other quotes you could pick before you settle on yeah. Jordan fucking Peterson. It's you know my dad likes Jordan Peterson, and my dad, for the record, like voted for Trump once and didn't the second time, and now considers the Republicans to be like a very unhinged and dangerous anti democratic like anti democracy party. But he still thinks Jordan Peterson's like he's he's not on Twitter. You know, he doesn't does see it. Does your dad shit. have a have an opinion on the uh, the 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 Chinese uh, uh, dick sucking machines that P- Peterson no, posted about? No, he, he he didn't believe me when I told him that. So you do have to keep in mind there are some normies out there that like casually read Jordan Peterson's self help book about I cleaning your room and were like, Great. I come across that <laughs> a lot. Like a lot of a lot of on like when you when you meet somebody like for the first time they and you ask them like what they're reading. A lot of times mm-hmm. it's that, and it's very innocent. And it's because they're not cr- criminally online like we are. The, like right. they just don't know or are not focused on politics at all. And that, and they just come across a self help yeah. book, and they're like, "Wow, this is really interesting." And it's like, "Oh," and then you have to give them the bad news about him, and you're like, like "Actually, yeah, he, be- he believes they- the Chinese government is harvesting cum from prisoners." I'm like, and- "Actually, <laughs> sir, did you know?" <laughs> and it also means they haven't listened to an interview from Jordan Peterson in right. like any no, point in the last it's, several no. years. No, but it's, it's not just the book. Unhinged. That, you know, it's they have it's, it's, it's the book it's the only same thing. I have some like friends who are not online and fairly nice people who like listened to Joe Rogan 10 years ago and are like, yeah, he seems fine. And it's like, well, yeah, yeah. Like, how much is it worth arguing about this? Like, <laughs> like I myself, well, the first podcast I ever listened to was Joe Rogan. And, um, yeah. you know, I listened to it for a fair amount of time until like Brett Weinstein and shit started coming on. And I was like, ooh, this is this is too fucked up for me. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I haven't listened to Sangster's podcast appearances, but like I haven't run into anything, at least in his bibliography, that makes me think he's like clearly insane. But people should be aware of this caveat. So even within the Cheka, Beria is controversial. Uh, he was accused of repeatedly convicting the wrong people for political gain or plain mean spiritedness and for allowing actual political enemies of the new state to escape. Right. Like he's constantly letting people who are actually trying to, like, bring back the monarchy to get out of jail and executing like socialists who had fought against the czar. Um, When you put all when you put so much resources into taking out your own political opponents, you mm kind of miss the broader spectrum of actual political opponents. Right. Right. And in between executing and arresting basically whoever he engaged in some light pedophilia. All right. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there we go. We're not getting into like the most problematic stuff, but this is bad. 
he first met Nina Gigechkori, uh, age 16, through one of her relatives who was a prominent Georgian Bolshevik. Um, he had spent, this guy, her uh, her relative, had spent time in prison with Beria and apparently told Nina, hey, I was locked up with this weird murderer everybody's scared of. You should go on a date with this guy. Um, I mean, that's Beria, how I met my first wife. Sure, right. Who wouldn't, <laughs> you know, who wouldn't take that, that bitch? I mean, yeah, so, yeah it's, you know, it's one more thing he has in common with Stalin. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those like they both really like underage girls. Instead of his uh, his online dating profile, instead of like holding up a fish, it's this like bloody dude he shot in the back of the head. Like I'm a (laughs) checkist, you know, right Um, next to a pickup truck. Once again, yeah, 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 and his. His, his quotes from Jordan Peterson. So they go on a date or whatever, and Beria proposes soon after. Um, and when they get married in 1921, she is still a child. Now, we get different accounts of what, I don't know if you'd call it, you wouldn't call this a meet cute, but we get different accounts of how no. they actually meet. And none of them are from flawless sources. One story comes from Stalin's daughter, Svetlana Aliluyeva, um, who was a bit of a mess herself, although it is hard yeah. to blame her for that, right? Yeah, Stalin's her uh, dad. <laughs> Stalin is her dad. You get some grace from me for that. She claims that Beria visited Nina's village when he was promoted to the same job that he had for the Cheka in Baku, but in Tbilisi. Um, Nina came to him to beg for her brother's release. Quote, Beria had arrived in a special train. Nina entered his car and never again saw her native village. She was carried off, her beauty having caught the police boss's fancy. He locked her up in a compartment. That was how she became his wife. Now, that's a pretty horrifying story. The timing of Beria's actual promotions with when we know he met Nina doesn't quite match up. Now, it's it's very likely, in fact, that Svetlana might have the broad strokes right, but have gotten some dates and stuff wrong, you know, mm-hmm. wouldn't wouldn't be weird. Sangster notes, quote, the story Stalin's daughter relates probably grew from the possibility that they had eloped on Beria's train. Despite his sexual predatory nature, the marriage lasted and, quote, she remained in love with her charmer for the rest of her life. How now, many people get whisked away in their own personal train, you know? Right. I mean, that is pretty romantic uh, if you discount all of the horrible things. You want to get on my murder train, baby girl? Yeah. Yeah. Who does? Who doesn't want a murder train, right? I know. I could go for a murder train. So oh, I have to God. settle for a public train. Sucks. Yeah. Yeah. And Can't you, kill a single person on there and get away with it. Trains. No, no, no. There's cameras. It's fucked up. Yeah. So. Amy Knight provides a different accounting of events. She notes that Beria met Nina when Nina was 15, and she can't, Nina comes to visit her relative in prison when he's locked up with Beria. Beria, from prison, is enraptured by the beauty of this child and remains obsessed with her. When the Bolsheviks take Georgia, Nina moves to Tbilisi with her adopted family, and Beria becomes a regular house guest. Quote, Nina was still young and a lighthearted schoolgirl. She once carelessly joined other students in a demonstration against the Bolsheviks, despite the fact that she was living in the home of a prominent Bolshevik. She later recalled in an interview given when she was already in her mid-80s how on that occasion she came home soaking wet because the police had sprayed the student demonstrators with water. Sasha's wife, Mary, was furious, threatening to whip Nina because she had expressed opposition to the Bolsheviks. One day, Beria stopped her on her way to school and asked her to meet him later for a talk. Nino agreed, and when they met Beria, proposed marriage. She recalled, we sat on a bench. Lavrenti was wearing a black top coat and a student service cap. He told me that for a long time, he had been very taken with me. What is more, he said that he loved me and wanted to marry me. I was 16 years old at the time. And so that's the version of events that she would later give. You know, Nino would later, you see it both as Nino and Nina. That's the version that she would give, right? And in this version of events, which like, I don't know which of these, all of these are bad because she is a child in all of these. Um, Yeah. Her re- recollection of events is that, like, yeah, he kind of like sweeps her off her feet, right? Noted romantic, like hopeless romantic, romantic Lavrenti Beria. Yeah. Now, in this version of events, Beria wanted to go to Belgium to study oil processing for the Soviet government, but they wouldn't send an unmarried man, and she agrees to marry him because it's better to have one's own family than to live in someone else's, which is not an uncommon story. That, like, and again, you have to think this is a a different time. She's like living with her parents and under her dad's roof. And is like, well, I would rather be the number two person in my household than a child. In yeah. My household. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not trying to give Beria any slack here, and, but and like that's, that's her recollection of why she makes the call. Right. And 16 yeah. for the, er- the, the era wouldn't have been too yes. out of pocket or anything. It, It was not the norm, but it was not something that most people would have considered really problematic either. Right. It's not like, you know, 
like the, the story about Stalin's uh, underage yeah. mistress is yeah. much more glaring because I believe she was either 13 or 14 or yeah. something. And he's there's a lot going to be a lot more problematic shit about Beria yeah. and underage people <laughs> and just women in general that's coming later. This is um, almost the most innocent thing about him because at it least is, it was I romantic. Mean, but the, at least that's how Nino recalls it right now. I, again, I want to really emphasize every variant of the story here, including Nino's, agrees that Beria deliberately sought out a child bride. Right. Ugh. So calling him a pedophile. Very fair. Um, yeah, yeah, I take back what I said. Gross. Her version Ugh. of events is that, like, I was down because it meant more freedom for me, basically being number two in a household as opposed to a child, which, again, that's that's what she recalls. And she um, gets to go to Belgium. Who doesn't well, like going to doesn't, Belgium? <laughs> tragically. Beria never winds up visiting Belgium. Uh, this just doesn't happen. In late 1922, he gets transferred to Tbilisi as part of a plan by the Bolsheviks to make their suppression suppression of outlying territories seem less like a foreign occupation by having locals do the mass murdering of dissidents. And again, this is part of why Svetlana's account that he kidnaps her on a train doesn't quite work because they have already met by the time he's made head of the Cheka, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or deputy head of the Cheka or something like that. There's a lot of different titles he goes through. Um, so by this point, although st- Still pretty young, Beria's personality is fully formed, and his driving motivation seems to be the desire to improve his own situation through cunning and brutal violence. He becomes known for such quotes as, when we Bolsheviks want to get something done, we close our eyes to everything else. Never a good sign. Good way to do some mass murdering, I always say. (laughs) Sophie will tell you, that's that's my catchphrase, baby. Podcasters are the same way. So Georgian nationalism was still a major force in the area, which threatened Soviet plans to unite it with Azerbaijan and Armenia as a single bloc within the greater USSR. Beria is tasked with crushing this desire for independence. Mensheviks are also murdered en masse, and by 1922, mass graves had become a common sight. Sangster writes, During these early years, Beria proved to be cunning and proficient at seeking out and killing the opposition. Whole families and villages, people with the same surnames or the slightest connections, were murdered by the Cheka and the army. There was no mercy. It amounted to thousands upon thousands of victims. Of his own participation in these crimes, Beria would later write, Whatever cruelty that the Cheka had to carry out receded in my youthful conception at the time into the foggy distance, and I pictured only the difficult, dangerous obligations in the name of humanity's happiness. Ugh. This is accurate also to Sam Bankman Freed, who recently got sentenced to 25 years in prison. If you ever tell anyone anything that I do is justified because I'm doing it for the happiness of humanity, again, you got to shoot them, you know? Yeah, you know, the one thing um, that really improves humanity's happiness from my own personal experience is mass graves. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Who doesn't love a nice mass grave? You can have a picnic on them. It'll make really flowers grow flowers, well. Flowers, green yeah. grass. People talk about the downside of mass graves all the time, but never any of the benefits, you know? Everybody's so negative all the time. Couple generations later, free bones. Who doesn't like (laughs) bones, you know? Skulls are expensive. I know my skull guy is fucking taking an arm and a leg out of me these days. And, you know, several generations, you know, thousands of years in the future. Boom. Oil. uh Uh-huh. That's right. Again, it's almost green, Joe. You know, recycling thinking. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. You turn them from people who are using oil and polluting to people who are generating oil and Perpetual not Natural energy, baby. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like a solar panel. So Beria's thoroughness earned him the respect of Stalin, who was known to deport several loyal Bolsheviks to the east for the t- crime of not getting along with Beria. Uh, in one case, Beria asked for a deported rival to be recalled to Tbilisi so that he could beat the man for fun. <laughs> Other gifts given to Beria for his service in 1922 included a gold watch for courage and a pair of Browning automatic rifles, which is a legitimately rad gift. A pair? Um, yeah, a pair. <laughs> Can't just yeah. have one bar, man. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta double down on that shit. You got Beria <laughs> fucking bars akimbo, which is like the <laughs> ultimate version. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, fuck. So by the spring of 1922, the Federation of Transcaucasian Republics, which Beria and his colleagues had battered into submission on Moscow's orders, was inducted into the USSR as a single entity. The actual road to this point was so brutal. Again, they have to kill all of these Armenian and Azeri and Georgian nationalist politicians and all of these like kind of middle of the road social Democrats who had wanted their 
to, it wanted independent Armenian or Azeri republics, right? Mm. Or Georgian republics. You have to kill all of these people, right? And it this means that like Beria and his colleagues are murdering so many people that Lenin becomes aware of how many people have been massacred to avoid. And it, this isn't just to avoid them entering the USSR. A lot of these people are killed to avoid having them join the USSR as separate Caucasus states, right? right. For whatever reason, this is important. And Lenin gets kind of pissed off and he demands the Cheka cease its violence in Georgia. Now, this is going to be a pattern. Every time there's like a mass purge that kills a shitload of people, whoever's running the USSR will have to, once it ends, punish the people who did the massacre in order to like try and make the survivors not rebel. Basically, right? It's like, kind that's of impressive kind of because, go. like, Lenin is a guy who really fucking hated the Caucasus, uh, and mm-hmm. even he was like, "Whoa, Jesus. whoa, 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 slow down, <laughs> <Jesus>. there, buddy! <laughs> you killed how many people? Come on, man!" Um, and I think part of why he's pissed is that, like, he is aware that a lot of the people who get killed were people who like made the revolution happen, right? Um, and then get murdered. Now. By then, most of the people who might have provided resistance to an ambitious man like Beria were dead, and he used his position in Georgia as an engine to repel to propel himself upwards into the hierarchy of the USSR. During this time, revolutionary fervor was still fresh, and men like Beria were expected to live somewhat experimental lifestyles in line with their radical beliefs. Private displays of wealth were frowned upon, and Beria eventually formally requested to share quarters with his boss because communal living was seen as proper communist stuff. Um, again, God, what a terrible not gonna go, roommate. Yeah, horrible roommate. He's planning to kill you constantly. <laughs> Actually, it's a lot like most roommates I've had. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so he spends a significant amount of time with lower ranking checkists, which historian Antonov uh, Ovsinko notes was absolutely to spy on them. Quote, <laughs> at first, everyone trusted Leverenti Beria completely, but upon knowing him better, they were not able to be friendly with him. He was a master of intrigue and denunciation. Like no one else, he was able at the right moment to unleash a nasty rumor in order to ensnare his rivals on the way to the top. Then he would persecute them one by one. In doing so, the young Beria, whenever necessary, would convincingly play the role of a good old chap, simple and jolly. That's uh. how we remember him. Jolly old Beria. I, I always think of Leverenti Beria as, as a jolly old chap. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And then like, has this guy ever been in a room with anyone he wasn't actively spying on? Well, no, but, you know, I, who amongst us hasn't constantly spied upon our bosses and subordinates in order to... <laughs> Sophie, hey, present company excluded. Ooh. Yeah, I, mean, I have like three guys going through my producer's trash as we speak. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Normal stuff. Speaking of normal, Joe, that's the end of part one of four. Uh, what do you got for plugs to be plugged? To I, the uh, I am the host of the Lions of by Donkeys podcast. We talk about military disasters, crazy stories from military history, and also all around horrible shit, much like your show. And I'm also mm-hmm. a science fiction author, and you can find my newest series, The Undying Legion, uh, anywhere that you uh, procure your books from. Yeah. Well, check out Joe's books, check out Joe's podcast, and, you know, get really good at digging if you intend to get into revolutionary politics, you know? Uh, always good to be able to dig a big hole, you know? A lot of things you can do with a hole. A lot of things you can put in a hole. So, a lot of supervisors you can put in a hole. Supervisors, wow. your boss, wow. your roommate, wow. your roommate boss. Put them all in the hole. That guy you put you them in dislike. the hole, the problem's gone. Yeah, the guy you dislike, that guy you like. <laughs> Everyone Especially if you like them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the number one person to put in a hole. Anyway. This has been Behind the Bastards. Goodbye. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com. Or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.